as promised, we have one more video, a short one, to finish up the conversation on Lagrange polynomials. We're going to use it to approximate other curves, and then we're going to speak for a little bit about some limitations behind Lagrange polynomials to set the stage for some other techniques that we're going to be doing in the next couple of lectures. So again, not too, too long here. Uh, again, I just wanted to chunk up this conversation because there is quite a bit here. But we're going to start with an example of how we can use Lagrange polynomials to approximate other curves. That's how we open this section, if you remember. We were talking about how, you know, Taylor series, a Taylor polynomial, can approximate a curve, a function, about some center point, but that approximation tends to decrease in quality as we get away from that center point. So it would be nice if we had a way of uh, making uh, our estimate, our polynomial, more accurate over many more points. And Lagrange gives us the tools to do that. So let's talk about this example right here. I want you to look at what we have here. What we have here is a function, sine of x. That's this one here in the blue, kind of swirling on, doing its thing forever. I'll just get rid of that because it's ugly. Um, <clears throat> and the idea is I would like to find a polynomial that approximates this function well over the interval 0 to pi by sampling this function at three different points, 0, pi over 2, and pi. Essentially, what I want to do is find an interpolating polynomial that goes through the sine function here, here, and here. Three points, we're expecting a parabola. That's why right, there's one unique parabola that's going to go through those three points. And you can see that all in that this section right here, it looks like that polynomial, <clears throat> that, that parabola, is hugging the true function quite well. So uh, let's think about this. Uh, we need... The only difference from this and past examples is that we need to figure out what the y values are. And once we've got them, then we use the formula. It's business as usual. It's not very hard. So we need the um, polynomial that interpolates the points. Let's find them. So nothing too big here. I used some pretty nice numbers here. We would like... Uh, 0 and 0, that's 0 and sine 0. I'm just getting the y values from plugging into that function, so nothing too exciting. Uh, I need uh, pi over 2 and sine of pi over 2. So that's going to be pi over 2 and 1. And then finally, pi and sine of pi, which would be, uh, let's see here, pi and 0. So I need these three points. That's what I want. I'm going to have to have three different basis functions, and each one of those will be quadratic. So let's construct our basis functions. So constructing basis functions. If we do, we get the following. Our L1 is going to equal, uh, how does it go again? X minus X2, right? Skip over X minus X1, X minus pi over 2 x minus pi over, and then 0 minus pi over 2. 0 minus pi. Similarly, L2 is going to do the same, but it's going to skip over the pi over 2, top and bottom. So we're going to get x minus 0, x minus pi, over pi over 2, minus 0. Pi over 2, minus pi. We can simplify these later, but... I want to get to something. And L3 is going to skip over the pi, so it's going to be x minus 0, x minus pi over 2, over pi minus 0, pi minus pi over 2, just like that. Okay. So those can simplify down pretty nicely, but before we do anything else, let's remember what our polynomial actually is. So it's given by, uh, let's see here, p of x. p of x is equal to y1 l1 plus y2 l2 plus y3 l3. And we know quite well by looking at our points, right? This here, right there, is our y1. This here is our y3. This y1 is nothing more than 0. And this y3 is nothing more than 0. So these terms aren't even in play. So don't bother simplifying them down. You're just going to crush them anyway. The whole Lagrange polynomial is given by that second term. 
So it's going to be given by, let's see, uh, the second y value was 1. And L2, if I simplify that down, looks like it's going to be, let's see, um, we have x, uh, x minus pi. And on the bottom, it looks like we have pi over 2 times minus pi over 2, if you do the math there. So pi over 2 times minus pi over 2. And you could flip this around a little bit. It looks like we're going to get like a 4 over pi squared or something like that with a minus sign. So if we simplify that, we get minus 4 over pi squared x, x minus pi. So I want to point out a couple of things here before we put this away. We can see quite easily here that the roots of this thing are going to be at x equals 0, x equals pi. And you can see that exactly in our picture, right? It has x-intercepts there and there. So it makes perfect sense. We have a negative in front. And that makes perfect sense too, because of everything you know about parabolas and what Mrs. Smith taught you in, in grade 10. Um, you know, you have a minus in front, so you're thinking about a downward facing polynomial. So take a look, make sure that your answer makes sense. And I think it really does here. This is the polynomial that is chosen to interpolate those three points. And as a result is more accurate over a longer stretch of X values. Pretty cool, huh? And, and not really that hard to get your mind around, I think. Okay, so seems really good, right? Seems really good, and yet the next section that we're going to talk a little bit about issues. Issues with Lagrange polynomials. Lagrange polynomials can be really useful for understanding our, our understanding about polynomials as a numerical method. It's great, but it does also come with problems. I'd like you to take a look at an example consisting of a set of eight data points and a relationship that might seem pretty obvious. So I've got eight points, I chose these, and I ran code to find an interpolant for this. Okay, imagine that you're taking uh, some data measurements in an experiment, in a lab, something like that, and you get 2.1, 2.05, 1.99, a 2, a 2.1, a 2.3. But then there's this weird little spike, this one bump where one data point is what clearly looks to be an outlier to this data, a four. Okay, maybe you're thinking that the relationship here is mostly constant or maybe linear with a slight slope one way or the other, who knows. Um, the problem is that, that one outlier piece of information, which may or may not be accurate, well, okay, it throws some things off. So a couple things. The other the other data isn't perfectly on whatever that is either. And we're looking for a high degree polynomial. This looks like we have what? Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different points here. I forgot the last one here. So we're looking at a seventh degree polynomial. For a seventh degree polynomial to catch all of these points, as well as the one outlier, I want you to take a look at the result. It does seem that despite of uh, the fact that there's an outlier, that otherwise it's mostly a constant relationship. And yet when you try to do the job of fitting the curve, this is the wildness that you get. Okay, if you use some coding, because you don't want to do this by hand, it's a, it's a high degree polynomial and the result is, is crazy. It's a seventh degree polynomial that swings wildly. So it jumps up through one point and dives down to catch the, another, the next one and goes back and forth and it goes through all of those different points. But this here is unlikely to be the true relationship that's given by that data to begin with. So we're trying to use these very high polynomials, but because of the nature of high, high degree polynomials and the fact that they can have these bends and twists and so on, to get them to to, to bend and twist just right, to get them to fit the data in just the right way. And there's one unique, there's one unique seventh degree polynomial that goes through every single one of these points. And this is the one, not cool. Okay, so in fact, this sort of thing is not just one example that I crafted up. This is typical. When you're dealing with even slightly noisy data due to the nature of how polynomials change 
uh, sensitive to their coefficients and so on. And that kind of result is not usually desirable. It's not very useful um, for modeling purposes. Um, uh, this is not a good fit. So where we're going to be going next in the course, our next topics that we'll be dealing with soon are going to talk about ways that we might be able to fit lower degree polynomials, even when we have a large number of terms, or ways to incorporate uh, more information about those different data points to make sure that we get the shape just right. So perhaps we can find a better method to achieve the same goal, but with better results. So we're going to be talking about a method called Hermite interpolation, which is going to make things seem, uh, I don't know, much more challenging. The formula is really, really difficult. Uh, I generally am not going to make you memorize it at all, but we'd like to have an understanding of what's going on with that. And uh, we're going to talk about another method as well of uh, putting together polynomials before we talk about an important one called splining, which makes sure to cap the degree in a particular way. Um, and we're going to see what that's all about within the next few lectures. So I hope you'll join me. Um, hopefully this uh, made some sense. As always, I'm going to do a little bit of a, uh, a thank you. We're getting close to that midway section of the course. Hopefully these videos have been okay. I urge you to contact me. I urge you to come to my office hours, send me an email if you have any suggestions. Um, and uh, yeah, keep in that communication. Uh, make sure that you understand what's going on and make sure that I understand how I can do better for you. Okay, uh, so I'll see you in the next video. Uh, and until then, take care of each other. And uh, yeah, I'll see you then.